it's Sunday morning and we're studying a myriad of things. We're studying predestination. And there's so many things connected to this. We are predestined. Predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. This is what predestination is about. The Bible says the people that God foreknew, whom he did foreknow, foreknow Romans 8, 29. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. The very meaning of the word predestinate tells you what we're predestined to. Well, predestinate is the word prohorizo. This is what you call in the Greek an aorist indicative mood. An aorist indicative mood. Anytime you look that up in your analytical lexicon, it means past tense. That's what it means. That's all it means. Past tense. That means it's something that God has already done. Now, but it can be more than that in one sense because when you have an aorist, A-O-R-I-S-T, aorist tense, that is something that began in the past, past. But you have various types of aorist tense verbs. You have a constitutive, constitutive, a consumative, consumative, and you have an ingressive. Now these are just three. You have an epistolary aorist, but it's used in the epistles only. We're not going to get into that. This is the common aorist tense. By the way, the word aorist, this is interesting. It comes from the word horizo, which is part of the word predestinate. And it comes from horizo. It's a, it's a construction of horizo, which is the word to bound. Horizo is the word bound. It's our word horizon. And pro, which means pre or before. So God has before bound us in the horizon, in the light, in the light. And horizo, when you place the alpha in front of horizo as a negative particle, it negates the word and means no boundary. That's what it means. And that is the word aorist. So there's no boundary to this verb. How do you tell what kind of a verb it is? Well, Mr. Mount says you have to go by the grammatical intrusion. What does that mean, grammatical intrusion? That means looking at all the scripture from one end to the other, the overall understanding of the force of the verb, not just according to the word, but according to everything else in the scripture. You have to look at a word and everything that affects that word and everywhere it's going to be affected, which would be throughout the scripture, whatever the grammar forces upon that, then you'll know if it's a constative. That means the action started in the past, but it continues to some point and only the scripture itself will tell you when it stops. You have the consumative. Consumative means it happened in the past and say, he died. And that's it. He died in the past. It was once. But you say, if you say, well, he died and he dies daily, that would be a, that would be a constative and an aggressive. Ingressive is 
and ingress. When I was in real estate, you'd have landlocked properties. I, I put a house on, I put a piece of property one time on the market, and it was up, uh, up the other side of Gallatin, out one of those roads out there, and it was locked behind this land here. It was like back here. Well, there's a law that says that the man that owns this house right here, if you own this property back here, he has to give you an ingress, a road back to your property. That's the law. He has to give you a, a little road that'll go back here. Even if you build a house back here, he has to do that. Well, an ingress, him an egress, egress is a way out. It's a way coming out. It's a road out. Well, this, an ingressive verb, a word, it means the movement starts, but there's no way of understanding the end without the grammatical intrusion, what the scripture itself says to force the verb. There's no way of just looking up some words and say it's absolutely this and this only unless you look at it in the light of all other scripture. Now, so when you look at this word horizo, God has not only preordained us for the light or for the boundary of light from the foundation of the world, His work is constant in us to conform us to the image, the icon, the likeness of Jesus. It is a continual thing. He is constantly bounding us in the light, and how does he do that? If we have to be conformed, to be conformed is one word in the Greek. It's the word sumorphos, S-U-M-M-O-R-P-H-O-S. Now, morphe means to shape. We talk of a metamorphosis, metamorphosis, that is a shaping it's a shaping with or in fellowship with. That's a metamorphosis. Well, we're shaped. Sumorphos has much the same meaning as metamorphosis because meta and sum are sometimes used as synonyms. So we have to be shaped in fellowship with one another. That's why it is so important the fellowship with believers. Don't just sit at home and say, I can watch the, I can watch you on the internet. I'll watch you on a live stream. I'll watch you on, I'll watch you on your DVDs, but I just don't like to be around people. Well, that's the problem you've got with your disposition and personality. You need to overcome that. A lot of people don't realize we're just common people here. We don't, we're not fancy folks. We're just common. Now, so the Bible says, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed. If you have to be conformed in fellowship with one another, that's because you're not conforming when you first come to the knowledge of truth. You start off like a little baby. I, I keep bringing it up. You got the inner man, which is Christ, and that is Christ's birth in each one of his predestinated elect family. And then you have the outer man. The Bible has much to speak about this inner and the outer man. There in Romans 7, Colossians the third chapter, and Ephesians the fourth chapter. We're to put on this, this in, we're put on this new man, and we have to start eliminating the outer man. Now the outer man has a lot of the that's called the old man. Our old man is crucified with Christ. Paul said in the sixth chapter of Romans. Our old man is crucified with Christ that the body of sin might be destroyed. Well, this body of sin is this self out here. You're not perfect, perfect until you come, until God works on you over the years. I've had some people complain lately. They say, we're not, they've complained, they've been associated with grace and truth. They say, we're made perfect when we come to Christ. Well, that's true only of the inner man. That inner man cannot sin. This outer man can't quit sinning, but he will sin less and less through the years. I asked a lady on the phone last night. She was my age. She's a couple of months younger than me. I said, 
do you want to do the same things that you wanted to do at 25 and 30? She said, oh, no, not at all. I said, I don't either. Because God's been working on us for a long time to get rid of contention, strife, envy, jealousy. What if I said, or gay? Huh? Now, if you've got a lot of or gay in you, God's got a lot of work on you to conform you to the likeness of Christ. We're going to be talking about being made perfect. Now, I don't know how much I'm going to get into that this morning, but there's a common word in the New Testament. In fact, let me show it to you over here. In learning the, this picture of how God's working on us, this is a long time in learning. Look here in, in Matthew, the fifth chapter, Matthew 5. In verse 48, and he's, this is referencing the previous verses about loving your neighbor in the previous verses. And, of course, love is agape. That means to walk in God's commandments concerning your neighbor. It doesn't mean to like everybody you come across. Besides that, a neighbor, Jesus said, was the man that gave you the things you need. So the believer that's giving you what you need is your neighbor. The guy next door to you that cusses and drinks and smokes pot, he's not your neighbor. Your neighbor is the one who gives you the things that you need. Neighbor was a, a term among the, the Jews. They said a neighbor in the halakha, the Jewish uh, traditionary law, they said a neighbor was a proselyte that was brought into Judaism. Jesus said, let me tell you who your neighbor is. The lawyer came to Jesus and said, what is the first and great commandment? Jesus said, you know what it is. You tell me what it is. He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and thy neighbor is thyself. Jesus said, that's well said there in the 10th chapter of Luke. He said, and the scribe or the lawyer said, well, who is my neighbor? Aha, there's the question. He already believed when this man, when we're talking about the good Samaritan, this scribe, knew who he believed the neighbor was because in the Jewish traditionary law, which was the twisting of the law of Moses, the halakha, the Jews had already established that a neighbor was a proselyte coming into Israel. And he's going to try to trip up Jesus. So he tells, Jesus says, you want to know who your neighbor is? He said, there's a man on the Jericho road and he fell among thieves. And they robbed him, beat him up, threw him in the ditch, and a priest come along. He sees him out there and he says, I will get filthy. That man may be a Gentile. He might be something I'm not supposed to touch. So he walked by. Then a Levite come by. He does the same thing, ignoring the man, afraid of uncleanness. And then a Samaritan comes along. And the rabbis, they hated Samaritans because Samaria was northern Israel and northern Israel had never come back from the captivity and they had mixed all their beliefs with the Assyrian sun and tree god beliefs. So during the days of Jesus, only southern Judah is back from the captivity, not northern Israel. So the Pharisees hated the Samaritans. And he said the Samaritan came along, picked the man up, dressed his wounds, took him to an innkeeper and said... You take care of him, and when I come back, he said, if he owes anything, I will pay it. And then Jesus stood back from the scribe, and he said, tell me, which of these three men was neighbor to him that fell among thieves? He didn't say that the man that fell among thieves was the neighbor. He said, which of the three? And boy, that Pharisee, he was like... Oh, I don't want to say this. I suppose the Samaritan. I hate that word in my mouth. Spitting it out. And Jesus said, that's true. That you've well said. The man who gives you the things that you need, that's your neighbor. So you can't come up and say, my neighbor is uh, the guy next door. No. Now, so when we're going to be made perfect, 
look, look here. He says, love your neighbor in this chapter. Love thy, thou shalt love thy neighbor there in verse 43. And they said you're supposed to hate your enemy. Jesus said you're supposed to love your enemy. Love. That's agape. That's walking in the commandments of God. Walk in commandments of God around and concerning your enemy. Well, of course, the commandments are more the commandments are more than the Ten Commandments and more than the law in the Old Testament. When you have an imperative mood in the Greek, you have an imperative mood, that is a command. And I'm not going to go through a whole lot of those. Just strive to enter into the straight gate, humble yourself under the hand of God. And one of the imperative moods is be angry at the winds of doctrine that make the church apathetic. There are winds of doctrine going around that toss men to and fro. And we're supposed to be angry. We're commanded to be angry or gizomai. People say, why are you angry at Kenneth Copeland? Because I'm commanded to. I don't have to make an effort to be angry at Kenneth Copeland lying to the sheep and stealing from widows and orphans. It is a natural, it's a natural thing to the believer to be angry. It's not something you have to be convinced of. When you have the Word of God written in your heart, you're going to be angry at people that are stealing from the poor. This is the way it works. That's what a believer is made up of. That's part of his makeup. It's innate to a believer. It's innate to the, it's innate to the inner man. Now, well, what is this? Let's go ahead and read this down here. Look down here in verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect. It does not mean to be without sin. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Be ye. Is the word S E S S E. E S E S. T H E. Este. That word be, now notice a small word how important it is. This is a small word. You be, therefore you be perfect. And that word is future tense. He's talking to believers. He's saying, I want you to be perfected. And the word is teleos, T-E-L-E-I-O-S. That's the word perfect. And that word means to mature. And you'll find that it's used many times that it, that it means to be of full age. When you're of full age, what are you? You're grown up. You're mature as a believer. It doesn't mean you're without sin. There's a part of you that is without sin, and there's a part of you that's not. There's a part of you that doesn't have any orge in it. There's a part of you that doesn't have any jealousy and envy or strife and contention, and that's the inner man only. But the outer man has that, and over the years, fire and trial and tribulation, persecution, that will cause most of this outer man to be canceled out, but not completely. Go over here to 1 John. I've quoted this so many times. This is a favorite verse. This is a verse that the Nazarenes use. Now, Nazarenes are kind of like a synthetic Pentecostal. That's what they are. They're Pentecostal without the tongues and without, I don't know if they believe in faith healing. I don't think they do. But they believe in living perfect above sin. They'll tell you. I knew a, a Nazarene lady. People say, you shouldn't talk about these people. Certainly should. It's erroneous doctrine. I knew a Nazarene lady lived down in Madison. She said, I was talking to her. She's a real sweet lady, a real gentle lady. She said, when we make a mistake, I went, oh. So <laughs> she called sin a mistake. When we make a mistake... Uh, she's not going to say when we sin. Well, look here in First John. Now, Paul talks about the inner man and the outer man in Romans 7. Well, let's look at that first, then let's go to First John. I just want to spell this out to you. Go to Romans 7. I won't... Now, when somebody... I've had a lady tell me recently, well, you have to live above sin. You have to live without it. 
Paul talks about being perfect. He's talking about being a mature, grown-up, full-age believer. Now, he says here, he's talking about himself, and if you'll notice these verbs, they are present tense. Look at uh, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am. When you see the being verb am, it is present tense. When you get into the being verbs, we use them. A lot of people use them correctly. If you, here's the being verbs. Be, is, am, are, was, were, being, been, have, has, had, do, does, did, shall, will, should, would, may, might, must, can, could. That's like one word to me. That's why I can say it. May, might, must, can, could. That's the longest word. All this is the longest word in my vocabulary. Can, could. It's like saying one word to me. I've said it so many times. It's like a word. And if you get to learning something that way, it'll get to be a word to you. Well, when you use is, that's singular. He is. She is. I am. They are, this is, you use plural with this, singular, singular. He was, she was, that's singular. They were, that's, you use that with plural. Uh, and it goes on. He has, he, singular, they have. So you have to learn, and you use those words that way. So next time you think they have, say, oh, that's plural. Have, there is plural. So you use that with plural. Now. Where was I? So when Paul said, and do is a form, every one of these words is a form of be. It's just a form of be. I be. I am. Same thing. Now, that's why when Jesus said, I am, he was saying, I be, I will. To be or to exist on your own means I am the existing God. I be, I am. Now, so Paul says, I am right now. Present tense, am right now. I am carnal. Now, how can Paul be living without sin if he is S-A-R-K, Sarkikos? Sarkikos comes from the word sarx, S-A-R-X, which is the word flesh. He says, I am fleshly. He even calls the Corinthian church in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians a carnal church because they're fighting and have contention and strife in the church and they're arguing over who's the holiest and who their leader is. People say, but you've got to be perfect. Well, the Corinthian church was far from perfect. The Galatian church was way out of line. You can't say these people were vessels of wrath because they hadn't been perfected yet, can you? They weren't grown up spiritually. They weren't teleos or teleotes. They weren't completed. When you find the word perfect, it don't mean to be without sin. So Paul says, I am carnal. For that which I do, present tense, I do right now. I do not... No, in my life. I do I allow not. For what I would, that's what I do. But what I hate, which is sin, that's what I do right now, present tense. I've heard preachers say, Paul's talking about what he was in the past. No, he's not. He's talking about, I'm wrestling with me right now. You're wrestling with that outer man. The outer man is not dead completely He's just dying off slowly. When the Bible says mortify the deeds of the flesh there in Colossians 3 and 5, mortify necro means to kill off. Well, if you're already dead 
and it's already been killed off, why is he giving an imperative command? It's an imperative command, by the way. Why is Paul giving an imperative command to kill off self if you're already dead to the flesh? Why would he be telling the Colossian church that? It's because they're not dead to the flesh, and neither are you, and neither am I. Not completely. I'm more dead than I was when I was 35. Because I don't want to do the things, I don't want to do the things that displeases God. And I didn't have any question about him. When you don't have any question about anything you're doing, that means you're very young in the faith. As you get older, you start questioning everything you do. You start saying, should I be doing this? Should I say that? Should I do that? You're not perfected yet. There's a lot of orge needs to get out of most people here. Orge is wrath and anger, it's fury, it's revenge, it's vengeance. I'll get him for doing that to me. The Bible says that has to come out of us. Every once in a while it'll flare up in me. Sometimes you will mistake. When the Lord says be angry, let me say something here. Don't call everything or gay when you get angry. Don't call everything or gay. What I'm saying, Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry at the winds of doctrine. That is a command. At the winds of doctrine that making the church apathetic, that's tearing the church up, that's destroying the flock in the previous verses. That word be angry is orgizomai. That is not the orge. That's a command from God. God wants us to come out of orge. If people are doing something to God's word and hurting the flock, you're, you're commanded to be angry at that. When somebody starts... If you want to call me names, that's okay. I don't care. I have, we have so many emails come in and Tom's answering them back. And there's this Jim Brown. He's a low-down, low-down false teacher and a liar. And he's saying this. And he says there's no water baptism. He don't believe in demons. And we both there's demons because Jesus said there was. No, he didn't. And they'll cuss me and fuss at me. And Tom will get to writing them back and forth, sending them emails and trying to explain things to him. Finally, he says, I give up. Well, when somebody, that don't bother me. But it's when somebody starts buzzing around to people around the country and feeding lies to false, to, to little baby sheep and saying, Jim Brown's doing this and Jim Brown's doing that and Grace and Truth Ministries is messed up and we've had that going on recently. That angers me. Because it's against the flock and I'm supposed to be angry over that. I'm commanded to be. It's the natural thing inside of me. It's my nat my spiritual nature to be angry if you devastate the flock. The shepherd, when the as a wolf come in and started messing with the flock, he got his sling out, he got his weapons out, and he went after the wolf. He was angry. When you're getting what anger at somebody does to you, that's the orge. That's supposed to leave over a long period of time and it will. I've been angry at some people that do things to the flock. That is a godly anger. Now, let's continue reading here. In Romans. For that which I do is not what I know in my life. What I hate, that's what I do. Notice all these words do are present tense. And then, if then I do which I would not, I consent unto the law that it's good. If I do sin... I'm saying when the law condemns me for it, the law is good. That's what Paul is saying. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. It's that outer man that's within this old body of mine. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. He's not saying the inner man. He says in this flesh, the outer man, there's nothing good. God's got to kill that off, and it takes a long time to kill off self. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I don't find in me right now, Paul said. How to catergadzomai. 
K-A-T-E-R. Katergadzo, K-A-T-E-R-G-A-Z-O-M-A-I. That word katergadzomai comes from ergon, ergon, which is the word toil. And kata means with intensity or down. It means intense in this case. It means to toil with intensity to do good. Paul said, I don't even know how to do that. If there's not something in me dealing with me, I won't do right. I will not conform to the likeness of Jesus if God's not doing it in me. And if you think this is going to happen all of a sudden one day when you come to the knowledge of Christ, it will not. It'll go away. The old saying, self dies hard, doesn't it? Just will I die? God's got to put you through fire. He's got to give you some cancer. He's got to make your family break up. He's got to make your wife, your unbelieving wife leave you, your unbelieving husband leave you. He's got to make you lose your job. You got to end up 50 years old with nothing. Watch out. And then he'll put you on your face and you'll say, Lord, I, I'm going to try to do things your way. He did that to me at 40. I was broke, had nothing. Everything you see in my life has come about since I was 40 years old. My house, my car, any property, this ministry, everything. I was broke, started from scratch at 40. And my life had just gone to the bottom and collapsed into nothingness. You have to be brought to a place, okay, Lord, I'll work for you. I'll quit trying to be rich. I'll quit trying to be somebody. I'll quit trying to climb the ladder. I'll quit trying to be this. I'll work as hard as I can for you, and you'll be the main thing in my life from now on. But that'll just be the beginning of being perfected and coming to full age. That'll just be the beginning. Don't happen all at once. I mean, there's people here that have seen me and known me. Eric's known me all his life, and he's watched me change. He'll tell you I've changed like nobody. I don't, I'm not the same me at 40. I'm not what I was at 45. You got to change. It has to overcome you, but it'll be God that does it. And then he goes on to say, when he says, how to perform that which is good, I find not. What's amazing to me, Paul tells the Philippians in Philippians 2.13, he says, work out your own salvation. Well, the Church of Christ loved that verse. They say, see, you work it out your way and I work it out my way. That's what they say. They use that verse. But the word work out is the word katergadzomai. Paul said, I don't know how to katergadzomai. And then he turns right around and tells the Philippians, katergadzomai your salvation. Work it out. And it's an imperative command. How? Well, the next verse in Philippians 2, he says, For it is God that works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. So what he's doing to you with fire and trials and tribulation, he's working in you, causing you to be willing to give up that outer man, and that takes years. It's not going to go away all of a sudden, but because he, he says this here. Look here, let's keep reading. I didn't even mean to get into this. But here we are. How to perform, how to catch or guide by that which is good, I don't know how to do. Paul is saying, I don't know how to do it right now as a believer, and I'm writing, in the midst of writing, 14 books of the New Testament. Some say 13, I'm not going to argue that. But I'm here in writing this, and I don't even know how to do good. For the good that I want to do in my life, can you identify with this? what I really want to do and how I want to really serve God and read my Bible and witness to people. But he said, for the good that I would, I don't do. See, every one of us here have things we want to be doing and we just won't do it. I don't think I witness enough. I don't study enough. I'm not kind enough to people. I'm not point blank enough to people. I'm not truthful enough to people. I twist things. I get a little forward along the way. But the evil which I would not, what I don't want to do, that's what I do. Is anybody can say that with Paul? Huh? That's our nature, isn't it? And this word do is present tense. 
I've heard preachers say, well, that's what Paul's talking about, what he used to be. No, he is not present, it's due. That's one of the forms of the word, do. That's a form of to be. You can't do anything unless you're an existing person and have a will. But the will you have is one that God put in you because God is the only one that is the I am that exists and has a will and he does as he pleases in every one of his family members. Then he says, now if I do that, I would not. He's saying, if I do the things that I would not do, if I'm doing, if I'm looking at that girl, looking at that guy, looking at that car, looking at that house, getting mad for myself, if I do these things and I don't want to be doing them, it is no more me, self, that's doing it. But sin, the outer man, that's alive and well in me, and God get rid of that man. When Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take of his cross daily and follow me, he's saying crucify that outer man. That's what he's talking about. This is the guy that won't die, won't go away. Jim Brown would not go away from me when I was young. Isn't that why the cross is daily? Huh? That outer man has to die every single day. Every day. If he has to die daily... That means you got something in you that's not perfected yet. It has not grown up, doesn't it? But I'm 50 years old. I'm 60. Well, what? So what? You still got something that needs to mature, don't you? You still got to get rid of, rid of some of self that won't go away. Jim Brown, is. there's nobody bothering me in the world like Jim Brown. Boy, he has been a pill to me. He has... He wouldn't go away. He always wanted to lose his temper and scream and yell at people and get mad and drive fast. And Somebody cut me off in traffic, I'd get six inches from their bumper in my little sports car. You're not going to do that to me. And that's real good. He's going to hit his brakes. I'm going to hit him and die. And I really showed him, didn't I? <laughs> Has anybody here been as angry at traffic as I've been? I think that is so dumb. Now, look, I'm not calling you dumb, but I think it's dumb. <laughs> it's kind of like getting mad at a lawnmower, isn't it? I get mad at a washing machine. It won't start, and you need to call Fonzie, don't you? <laughs> Boom. Get it going. I find that a law that when I would do good, when I really want to do good, evil, the outer man, is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the only thing I can delight in. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. All this is about God is going to conform us, the people he foreknew. He's predestined to conform to Christ's likeness. Christ is the inner man. You're going to become like the inner man, and that man is perfect. He is without sin, but this outer man is not. The outer man is going to have to grow up and die and be and vote with the inner man. Remember, it takes two witnesses in Jewish law to put a man to death. The inner man says, I'm going to make you vote with me that you've got to die. And as you grow older, you'll start saying, Lord, I want to vote with you. I'm so tired of me trying to have my way. I can't get anything done in my life, being angry all the time with my orge, being jealous and envious. Lord, I'm tired of me. When somebody says, I'm tired of me, no, you're not, not if you're still arguing and fighting. An arguing a fight is the orge, it's contention and strife, and God hasn't eliminated that from you. He won't eliminate it completely till you're old and gray and got one foot on the grave and another on a banana peel. That's when he'll eliminate it. And you'll just about be gone, and that when you'll, you'll know when it's gone when you're dead two seconds. Then your orge will be completely gone. Then he goes on to say, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, against my noose, my thinking, in bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. 
Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, wretched man that this outer man is. I am a wretch. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, that was a Roman idiom and a Roman saying. Sometimes a man, when he would murder a man in the Roman Empire, they would tie the dead body around, up on his back and make him drag it around for days before they'd put him to death. And Paul is saying, I am dragging around a dead man. God deliver me from him. I used to say, Lord, I can't stand living no more. I can't get along with nobody. I'm fighting everybody. Day and night I've got bronchial asthma. I'm just stressed out all the time. I go to the hospital all the time. God, what's wrong? It was me. The only problem is you. It's, well, yeah, but you don't know what they did. It don't matter what they did. There comes a time you'll say, what they do is of no consequence. I have to live for Christ and everybody wants to do to me. I'll keep my mouth shut like Jesus as a lamb to slaughter, as a sheep before his shoes is done. He opened not his mouth. Preach truth, live truth, and quit worrying about the world. And life comes together. But it, it don't come together when you're holding on to that outer man. Paul says, O oh, wretched man that I am. Not O oh, wretched man that I was. I am right now, present tense. Then he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, with the noose, the intellect, understanding is what it means, N-O-U-S. With the understanding, noose. You remember the word noia? Metanoia is the word repent. It means to be turned and think differently. Think differently. Noose is the word mind. It's the thinking. It comes from this word noia. It comes from this word noose. He said men's thinkings are ruined. They're rotten when they are involved in this world and he's thinking of this world. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God. My thinking is on Christ, but... With the flesh, the law of sin. He said, I got two men in me. One is this inner man, that's Christ. And he keeps telling me, I got to get rid of this outer man out here. He's going to have to die. You'll be unhappy the longest day you live if God leaves you alone and don't kill off that outer man. You know what makes the outer man go away? You live through fire and trials and you go through divorce and you go through bankruptcy and you go through... You get sick and you go to the hospital, you got some cancer and they give you chemo or they give you something and you and maybe you get over that to a degree and then you get something else and you're in and out of sick beds and all of this for a long period of time and, you, and your finances are up in an upheaval and you wonder, what is wrong in my life? I thought God loved me. Well, he does love you, but you're involved too much in yourself trying to fix all your problems. We really don't believe God as believers when we stress out to the degree that it just wrecks our body with pain and sickness. Nobody has been more guilty of that than this man before you. I was dying in my mid-40s. I believed I was dying, and I believed I was going to die in the hospital. I was in and out for two to three years in just constant bronchial pneumonia. I was stressed to the hilt. I don't have any problems at all now, and I'm in my mid-70s. What happened to me? This man here was killing me, and he'll kill you. Your outer man will kill you. I am absolutely sure, as I'm standing here, when men come out from under stress, and they refuse to be bothered by the world, say, this is what God wants. You stole my car, you burned my house down, you killed my dog, and that's what God wants. So let me see if I can go find another dog in another place to lay down. If you learn to just accept what comes, that's self-dying. Well, people run over me when I do this. No, they've never seen anybody look at things that way. That mystifies people when you accept what comes. Actually, do you know that people are looking for somebody to fight with? And when you quit fighting with them, they go down the road and look for somebody else. 
Did you know that? It's like the old song that takes two to tango. Well, it takes two to tango. If one stops fighting, the other gets bored with fighting with somebody that won't fight. Did you know that? I won't fight people. They'll keep, oh, they'll get the last word in. And if you insist on get the last word, you'll keep in the fight. Forget the last word. God's going to have the last word, isn't he? So he says, I got these two men in it. And do you realize, when you get to chapter 8, chapter 8, the text doesn't end there. They didn't have books. When the Bible says book, it's the word biblios. It means scrolls, leather scrolls, or papyrus scrolls. The, the, the words continue into the next chapter. This is not a beginning of a new thought when you hit chapter 8, verse 1. Because it starts off, there is therefore. Therefore is a, is a coordinating conjunction. It's going to coordinate what's about to be said with what's already been said about these two different men. And he starts off chapter 8 by saying, there is therefore. Where are we going to go to in chapter 8? Are we going to get to verse 29 in there? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. This outer man, this outer man is what is being referred to in chapter 8 in Romans eight twenty nine. For whom he did foreknow. He foreknew us, birthed Christ in us, and we've got an outer man. The outer man and the inner man is what's talked about in chapter 7. And he's talking about conforming this outer man in verse 29 of chapter 8 to this inner man. He's talking about killing off this outer man when you get to verse 29. Do you see that? And everything between verse 1 and verse 29 is about how this outer man is going to die and conform to Christ's likeness. You see that? Let's just read a little bit of chapter 8. There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, which is the inner man from chapter, from the previous verse in chapter 7. Right? C-H-A-P-T-E-R and the, the numeral 8, that's not in the text. Therefore means a reference back to the last verse of the previous chapter and what's been said. There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but that's the inner man, isn't it? But after the Spirit, and the Spirit is truth. The outer man lives a lie in himself, saying, I deserve the world, I deserve things, my flesh deserves... And I don't deserve what you're doing to me. Well, yes, you do. You don't think you deserve the wrong that people do to you? After all, you've done to Christ and you've stepped on His name and splattered His name in the dust. <clears throat> Ezra, the ninth chapter, the Bible says God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve. You deserve worse than your worst enemies done to you. I deserve the worst things that a man could do to me. <clears throat> God's using these things to perfect us. That's what he's doing. Now, where was I? <clears throat> so, you got... I'm not there yet. I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Well, he says in the previous chapter, my flesh serves the law of sin. You see that in verse 25, the last, just the last little phrase. The flesh, the law of sin, and he says down here, the law of the, he says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from this outer man, the one that serves the law of sin. But this is a process. He's made me free because he's going to start killing off this outer man. He's killing it off our whole lifetime. If, you've, if you're as righteous when you're, if you live to be 90 years old and you're as righteous 
when you're 25 as a believer as you are when you're 90. What's the use of all the fire and the trial? The fire and the trial is to burn out all of that self. The trying of your faith is more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire. And you have to be tried by fire. So this trying is precious because it's going to make you give up self and it's going to start living the way you should and thinking the way you should. You'll quit thinking about people when they start giving you a hard time and they're trying to cut you down and lie about you. Doesn't the Bible say, bless you when men shall persecute, and say, persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake? Doesn't it say, bless you when men shall lie about you for the sake of Christ? Not when they lie about you for something you did in their life that had nothing to do with Jesus. That people have mixed those two up. Well, I did this to him, and then he lied about me. I stole something from him. He lied and said I stole something else. Well, that's not blessed to you when you do something wrong. When you suffer for righteousness' sake. Now, let's just read on here a little bit. For what the law could not do, verse 3, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, redeemed sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, in the inner man, who walk out not after the flesh, walk not after the outer man. You're still referring back to chapter 7. You walk not after the outward man, but after the spirit, which is the inward man. Isn't the Holy Spirit Christ in you? When the Bible says Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1, it doesn't mean there's a little bitty Jesus literally inside of you with a little bitty tiny body living in you. It's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the spirit that's living in you. So when you see the spirit here, that's talking about that inner man, isn't it? And then he goes on through here and says, for they that, they that are after the flesh, what did he say in that last verse of chapter 7? But with the flesh, the law of sin, I got these two men, I've got this outer man that walks after the flesh. So he says, they that are after the flesh are after the outer man from chapter 7. Do mind the things of the flesh. The outer man walks after the flesh. That's you in your body when you're not mature yet, when you're not grown, you're not of full age. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. But to be carnally minded as believers is death. If you live after this man, you'll get sick. It's death spiritually. You'll be separated from God. You'll be out here running with the world. A lot of believers are in that fleshly man and they walk after this flesh. They don't walk after the inner man. I walked after the flesh. Has anybody walked after the flesh as a believer like I have? I've done that for year after year. Out there in the world, in the music world, and pop music, trying to be somebody, and trying to get applause, and trying to get money, and trying to be famous. That's the flesh, isn't it? But to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded, that's the, you're still in the same subject of the previous chapter. To be spiritually minded is to look after the things of God. That's the inner man. And it's life in peace. Because the carnal mind, this man's thinking, this outer man, that by the Bible says is enmity against God. It is ekthra. Hostile. You're hostile to God and you're God's enemy. If you're friends with the world, as a believer, James 4 and 4, you're an enemy of God. You can't run with the world. We're supposed to separate from the world, aren't we? You say, boy, that's a hard line to follow. We're not supposed to be communicating with the world. Who do we communicate with? Over in Galatians, the sixth chapter there, the Bible says a man is communicating to him that teaches in all good things. You're only supposed to be fellowshipping. The word means to distribute, to communicate. Communicate, it is the word kononeo. Kononeo is the word fellowship. It's the word communion. 
It's the word have in common. The only people you're to have in common with is people who are struggling and wrestling with sin and they're believers and they're trying to fight their outer man. You're not supposed to be out here, and I'm going to cover this more tonight. You're not supposed to be out here running with people. I had a guy coming here one time and he said, we need to be feeding all the, the natives in India. Famine was God's first judgment, famine. And God doesn't want us going out and curing his judgment, does he? And they're worshiping Brahma and Vishnu and, and uh, all those gods and goddesses over there in India, and they refuse Christ. Let's go feed them. Let's take some woman who's got a baby on her hip, one on her breast. She's got six of them following behind her, and she's raising them to be Hindus, and we're supposed to feed her so she can raise those children to be heathens? No. God's first judgment was always famine. We take, I make an appeal for the poor and the needy. Every time we stand up here, I have been poor and needy when I was young, and that is for poor and needy believers only. People who are wrestling with sin. And this fellow said he leaves in the church because you won't, you don't believe in feeding the people in India. He had a stepdaughter he had a, that went out and got pregnant, and he wouldn't allow his wife to take any food to that baby. But he wants to go feed India. And you talk about a twisted man. He had a perverted mind. That baby couldn't help because it was illegitimately born. And it wasn't a vessel. It wasn't rebellious against God. It was just a baby. He wouldn't let her take food to it. He'd check her speedometer. He knew how far it was to the daughter's house. He knew how far it was to his, to his wife's work. And if she put more miles, he kept up with everything. said, where did you go here? She had to bring her money in every week and give it to him. She was a deputy sheriff in Nashville. And she'd make, he'd make her come in and hand her paycheck to him. Well, that's called a bully and a tyrant. All right. Now, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, verse 7, but is not subject to the law of God, neither can be, so then they that are in the flesh, the outer man, cannot please God. If you're just living for self as a believer, you're not going to please God, but if you belong to Him, He's going to beat that out of you. Well, I don't mind a headache for three weeks. The guy said, I had a headache for three weeks. I was suffering persecution. How about, I said, how about if God picked you up by your hind legs and just picked you up and banged you on the ground for about 25 years? You would think headache for three weeks. God give me a headache for six months, a year. Don't do that to me again. He has beaten me black and blue for 30 years. Till I came to my right mind. He'll put the mind in you with everything he puts you through. Has anybody been through any hard times? Oh, yes, sir. We all have had them. And you think, I can't stand this any longer. Whew. Me either, but I have to. You have to keep going. What do you do when everything seems to be falling down around you? Sometimes I get so grieved. I get so weary and so tired. I got no preachers that I know of out here that's telling the whole truth and trying to. And then I got the sheep fighting with each other. And I got them fighting each other in Oklahoma. I got them fighting each other out there in, out in Tucson. I got them fighting up in New York. And then they're fighting me and saying all these things. It's like, behave yourselves. And sometimes I want to go somewhere west. Just, go as, just keep going west as far as I can go and find me a hole and crawl in it. That's the way I feel sometimes. You ever feel like that? I felt like that for the last two weeks. Sheep, don't give me a hard time. I love you. Don't say the things and do the things you do. I love the sheep. I even love some of you that are contrary and you're fighting me. Please don't do that. I don't even know what to say anymore. I just, please. But it's amazing how people are living in the flesh, how they can act. And boy, they do act up, just like a little kid that won't be. 
you can spank them, you can beat them, you can send them to their room and make them stay there for a month. And they'll still do the same thing until they get enough spankings, they'll get tired of it. Now, he says, So then they that are in the flesh, verse 8, cannot please God, but you're not the outer man. You're not to be living that way, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, that's the inner man, isn't it? Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, which is the inner man, you don't belong to God. He is none of His. Now, holy, and, the, and the Pentecostals say, well, you got the Holy Spirit is a second work of grace. It is not. The Spirit has to be in you. You have to have the Spirit in you. When you're filled with the Spirit, that's when He gets rid of all this self. Filling you with the Spirit is a lifetime process of God as He fills you with the truth and gets rid of all these lies that self wants to live after. Isn't it? This is a message for the believer. You know what all this is about? It's about conforming to the likeness of Jesus, the inner man. That's all it's about. Self has to go. You say, well, I just don't feel that way. Well, you're 25 too. Or you're 20, or you're 18, or you're, maybe you're 40. Maybe you're 45 saying that. Maybe you're a babe in Christ, and God's going to have to beat you up. People say, God won't beat his wife up. The wife is the inner man. Not this outer man. He'll beat you up. People say, God won't do that to people. Well, he scourges every son he receives in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. He, cur he scourges every son he D-E-C-H-O-M-A-I. <clears throat> What's that word? Accept. You can't accept Christ. He has to accept you. When he scourges every son he receives, scourge is the word mastix. That's the word scourge. Scourge is not... Now, I'm going to hit you on the hand with this little flash water. They don't do that anymore. That's not a scourge. Now, don't do that. Do you think Jesus went into the temple when they were buying and selling and cheating the people out of money? He said, now, y'all get out of here. Now, scat. Oh, he went, Phew, get out of my father's house. He was angry. The scourge, that's the mastix. It is a scourge is the verb mastigao. That's the noun that's the noun. And Mastigao was a whip. It was the same thing as a cat of nine tails. It had pieces of glass and bone. And God says, I will beat you to a bloody pulp. I'll beat your body. I'll give you disease. I'll make you go broke. I'll make you lose your house. I'll do whatever I have to do to get it. I will put my attention in you. I'll get rid of your attention. I'm going to get rid of that outer man. And I don't care what I have to do to you, and I'll do everything I have to do until this outer man itself starts dying off. It's going to happen. That's what predestination is about. The people he foreknew, he's predestined to be conformed to Christ's likeness. That's because when you come to Christ, you've got an outer man that won't conform. Oh, gosh, I've seen so many young people. Well, I got saved last night. Praise the Lord. I'm going to go out and witness. And, man, it's great. It's wonderful. And they get involved in a plastic religion. It is, it's wonderful. It's fantastic. And then they kind of die down and they kind of wander off and go back out in their sin. That excitement is phony. True. Well, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction. It's not talking about any widow out here and any orphan out here. That word fatherless is the word orphanos. And Jesus said, when I go away, I will not leave you comfortless. And the word comfortless, orphanos. I will not leave the church orphans. I will send an inner man to live among you. And he will be in you, he'll be with you, and I'll never forsake you, I'll be with you always as that inner man till the end of the world. We just don't believe that the inner man can take care of us. We think we have to take all matters in our own hands and fix it, don't we? Yes. No, you don't. If you get old enough, you realize while the world's fighting, you just back off and you watch it. I ain't involved in that. Somebody comes up and wants to get me involved in art. I said, Luke, 
I don't do that. As your pastor, I'll step in there and say, all right, now, y'all having a problem? I know there's some fault on both sides, and I love you both. And we need to reconcile this with Christ's word, not with you. He said this, and she said that. We're not going to reconcile it that way. You start, need to start behaving yourself, both of you. Like I keep saying, it takes two to fight. Next time you get in a fight, stop fighting and watch how long it lasts. Don't last. But that's because you've got to have your way and you want the last word. Isn't that right? I've got to have the last word. He said this about me. I've got to say one more thing before we finish. Well, if you say one more thing, he's got to say one more thing. And then you've got to say one more thing, and he's got to say one more thing. You've got to say one more thing, and he's got to say one more thing. And the fight goes on forever. Just stop. Now, where were we? Ten. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. This is a dead man out here that's wanting to fight with the inner man. And he's not going to win if Christ just birthed himself in you by his will. Of his own will begat he us. That inner man was begotten by God's will, not by ours. We were born. That inner man was born in us, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God's will. He birthed that inner man in us. That's the new birth when that, that inner man that we see in Romans 7 is what Christ birthed in us and says self has to go. And over the years, I'll put you through enough fire, enough trials, and you will see that. You know what you'll do? You'll fight so long that you get tired of fighting and you get tired of having to be right. You say, let that guy have his way. It don't matter. I've come to that place. Let him have his way. Because he's on a tear. He's on a journey. And if he's on God's journey, God will stop him when he's ready. You don't need to stop him. That in-law, that son, that mother, that daughter, that you don't have to stop him. If God wants him stopped, do you think he can stop him? Does anybody have any problems like that with somebody you just want to stop? Well, you're not supposed to stop him. You can rebuke him and he'll walk away. And after the second admonition, they are heretics, heretic. Heretikos. It is, comes from heresis, H-A-I-R-E-S-I-S, -I -I which is our word heresy. It means a boundary line. It means to choose for oneself. It means self-will, self-will. When a man says, I'm going to have my will above anything else, leave the man alone. The Bible says he subverted his own house there in Titus 3.10. Leave him alone. Don't fight him or her. I know everybody here has got somebody they just nearly in a fight with or you're in a fight with them. An in-law, a family member, somebody at work, your boss, your husband, your wife. Quit. Believe me, if you quit, it'll go away. Yeah, but I've got to get him back. That's what that is. It's that you. That's you. That's not Christ in you. Then he goes on to say, if you'll notice, this is everything that the inner and the outer man's about. And when we get to Romans 8 and 29, the Bible says, for whom he did for no. Who do you think the whom that he foreknew is in this picture right here? You think he foreknew the outer man? You mean he had a forno, prognosco means to know intimately before him. You think he had a relationship with the outer man before the foundation of the world? He had a relationship with the inner man. Yeah. And the people he foreknew, he's predestined forno, prognosco. To know intimately ahead of time. That's certainly not self. Well, what's going to happen to me? Well, that's this flesh that wants its way. And this body's going to die and he's going to give us a new body to go with that new man. And you won't have any sin. Ain't that great? <laughs> he's, people say, I don't know if I'm saved. Well, that's because that's you saying that. <laughs> Certainly you don't know. You, self, don't know that he's saved. Is God going to save you, your flesh, that outer man. No, he's not going to save you, that outer man. He's going to save Christ in you and put a new body with it. 
That's the change that's going to come in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Behold, I'll show you mystery. We shall not all sleep. We'll be changed in a moment in the twink of an eye at the last trump. And this mortal shall put on immortality. This mortal man is going to become immortal. And he's going to match the inner man. But while we're on earth, God says, I'm not going to have you living like this. I will not live with a harlot. He says that in the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians. What do you mean a harlot? Well, Babylon is the mother of harlots, the mother of idolatry. It was founded on self or let us make us a name. It was founded on the outer man, wasn't it? It's really not as hard as it looks. Where was I? Eleven. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the inner man. If he dwells in you, the inner man from chapter 7. When you get to Romans 8, 29, it's about the inner man of chapter 7. Can you see that? He's not changing the subject anywhere here. In fact, chapter 7 is about chapter 6. Oh, by the way, chapter 6 is about chapter 5. Oh, I forgot to tell you, chapter 5 is about chapter 4. <laughs> this is one subject from, one to, from the beginning of this book to the end. Oh, isn't chapter 9 about chapter 8? You're talking about God loving Jacob and hating Esau? He's talking about an inner man and an outer man there. Esau lived after the flesh. God converted Jacob, and he was a deceiver, and put a new heart in him. And he said, Jacob, have I loved? Esau, have I hated? I've given my commandments, love, agape, to the inner man, that's Jacob, and the outer man is Esau. And they were twins from the same womb. And he's, that's nine chapter, oh yes, but the, but the tenth chapter is about chapter nine and the eleventh chapter He's talking in the 11th chapter. Well, I don't want to talk about that. That's too much. Back here to chapter 8. But if the spirit of him, verse 11, raise up Jesus from the dead, dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Huh? By his spirit that dwelleth in you. This inner man is going to quicken Z-O-O-P-O-I-E-O. -O -O. Make alive. Of course, poeo means to make into a beautiful picture, a tapestry or a mosaic. That's what poeo means, make alive. The inner man is going to make alive the outer man. How does he do that? He causes the outer man to die. And what is the resurrection? Anastasis. Anastasis means to come to life after dying. How often does the outer man have to learn to die? Every day. And if he has to die daily, he must have something in him that needs to be killed off. Or well, doesn't he? Self mortify the deeds of this flesh. He says that over there in Colossians. Quickly hold your place there. Look at Colossians. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Notice how all this goes together. Look here in Chapter 3, chapter 3. Look at verse 1. If ye shall be risen with Christ, that's the inner man, causing the outer man to die daily and resurrect in Christ. A time will come when he'll take over your outer man, but it's not going to happen all of a sudden, and he won't completely take it over because you'll have some sin in your body. But the time will come where he will cause this outer man to start living the way it's supposed to live. That's a long process. You actually think that old believers that have been Christians for 50 years have the same amount of faith or the same amount of belief or the same amount of, or the, or the lack of faith that a 25-year-old believer has? You think a 90-year-old has the same amount and the 90-year-old has been saved for 60 years and he's been a believer studying the Bible that long and they are equal when it comes to in the flesh living for Christ? That's not true. People say that's inequality. No, it's, it's simply God taking all these years of fire and trials and tribulation and per persecution to mature you and make you a full age. And he says... 
Seek those things which are above. Seek the things that the inner man seeks. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. Isn't that a, a conflict between the inner and the outer man? Yeah. Right there. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. This man out here is, is a dead man because sin is the transgression of the law. He lives in sin, and sin has slain him. Paul said, sin took occasion by the commandment and slew me. This outer man is a dead man trying to live with Christ. He has to die and resurrect daily in Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members. He's talking to a Colossian Gentile church who are believers. Why would he say mortify if you've already mortified everything and it's already over with? Why would he give you a command to necrao, kill off? Necromancy is talking to the dead. Necrao comes from necro, which means dead. Mortify is the word necrao, in E-K-R-O-O. -O. Kill off. He said, you're believers, and here's what I want you to kill off, and this is going to take some time to do it. It's a command from God. He says, kill off, therefore, the members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, Fornication, pornea, uncleanness, akatharsia, impurity, un uncleanness, inordinate affections, pathos, passions. I can't live without that. I can't live without her. I gotta have that car. This is killing me. It's hurting me. I gotta have my way. I've got this passion about, about things. Oh, I've gotta have it. That's inordinate. That is, we're supposed to be living calmly and quietly and peaceably and contented. Not just stressing out over what you think you have to have. Do you know that you've got what God would have you have today? You're not supposed to have any more than what you've got. You're not supposed to be any further than you are today right where you sit. But you're not supposed to stay there. You're not on a journey to, uh, to California to get out here on I-40 and you get 100 miles down the road and say, well, I'm through traveling. Well, you're not in California yet. You still got a long way to go. You got a long way to go, a lot of journey. You got a lot of trials, a lot of persecution, tribulation. In order and affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things say the orge of God, the orge that God puts on man, it comes from God, this Desire for revenge comes on man because he's contentious and full of strife and he's got to have his way and you can't say that to me. I'll get you back and I'm going to get the last word. And then he says, I'm going to have the last word. No, I am. No, I am. No, I am. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. You ever gotten an argument like that with somebody? What a waste of time. Because man's or gay, all these things comes upon him. So, in this perfecting, in this perfection, this teleos or teleates, when the perfect is come, when man matures, then these gifts of the, that the apostles had to be done away with. When the perfect man or the maturity of man comes about or the maturity of the church, it's all done. Which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In which you walked sometime when you lived in them. You were living in this outer man. Now therefore also put off these. Put off the outer man. Anger. Anger which is or gay. Wrath. Malice. Blasphemy. When he says put off, he's saying eliminate, but it won't happen one day. What I need to do to put it off, God's got to make you willing. And as you go through fire and trials, start thinking about what you're doing. I think about what I say to people. I think about what I'm going to say. And I go into the grocery store. Sometimes I've gone in that store a thousand times and I say, Lord, it seems like I can't talk to anybody anymore. They don't want to hear anything I have to say. Lord, if there's something I can say as I go in here, give me the opportunity very elect in there, Lord, lead me to him. And Lord, I know that 
I won't always touch the elect, but your words that I witness will be glorified in the destruction of the wicked. Don't worry about how many people you bring into the fold. Your duty is to say the truth and the rest is up to God. You've done your duty when you speak to people about the truth. That's it. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Let's read on. Lie not one to another. Stop lying. Stop being forward. Stop twisting words. Stop gossiping. Stop slandering. Quit thinking you got to talk about. Usually when somebody comes to me and talks about somebody else, they're trying to gain favor with the preacher. It's not because they even feel that about somebody else. But stop doing that. We're not supposed to be a God bobbing and gossip and slander. Well, I said what was the truth. It's never the truth if you say the exact same words that somebody said and you put the, a different inflection in your voice on it that makes it sound bitter and angry. You can't repeat what somebody says even if it's the truth. When you start talking about it, you can't do that. You've got to be very objective and look at things from a perspective that you're just saying, hey, here's the truth. I'm not trying to put anybody down, but here's the truth. But to repeat somebody's words with a different desire in your heart than it was originally said, even though it's exact words, that's gossip. And you know that you're trying to hurt these people. Don't say it. Lie not to one another, seeing that ye have put off the old man, outer man. And you're continuing to put him off. Remember I said aorist verbs, it starts in the past, but it's a continual putting off. Or it's a continual movement, according to the context of Scripture. Put off the old man with his deeds, and put on the new man. You think this is the Apostle Paul still talking about the same two men in Romans, the seventh chapter? It's the same, it's the same, same thing he's saying to the Colossians that he was said to the Romans. He says the same things to the Ephesians. In Ephesians 4, you got a new man. He's not like the old man. Which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We're renewed, but we're renewed, Paul said, day by day because we die daily. We're renewed, renewed daily. Go back over here to, how much time do I have, Mike? Ah. Before I get any further, let's go over here and see these two men. Look here in First John. First John. I've completely gone off my track this morning, but I hope, I hope I was going to get back into the orgay and Saul and I've kind of gone into the perfect man. Look here in look here in uh I went blank. Where was I going? Oh first John. First John three. This is the verse that the Nazarenes use. Look at verse nine. Whosoever is born of God. Now let me ask you something. Where's the, where's the new birth here between the outer man and the inner man? What's well, the inner man? That's what's born in you. That's the new birth. You must be born again. But you can't birth yourself. Not by accept Christ. There's no such thing. Not by sinner's prayer. God has a people that he's ordained. He births Christ in you. So whoever's born again of God by the will of God. Whosoever's born of God doth not commit sin. We know the outer man commits sins. That's what Paul said in that last verse of Romans 7, doesn't he? Yep. That's you. That's sin in you. And we know there's a man that can't sin. The only perfect man in you. The only, the only, I don't want to use the word perfect. The only sinless man in you is Christ in you. That man can't sin. And he says, I'm not going to live with this harlot of Babylon, which is the outer man. You must die daily. And you, and you don't do that when you're young. As you go through fine trials, God brings you to a reckoning point, and you begin to grow up, and you say, I, I've got to change my ways. I can't live like this anymore. We've got some people here that have lived terribly horrible, like Fred. Whew. Lived in, in biker bars every night, like Dave. 
traveling across the world with heavy metal groups. He'll tell me about how crazy they were, how drunk they'd get, the drugs and the, just the cussing and everything was crazy and didn't care about nothing. But that man, I've watched in these two men, I've watched the outer man die. You don't do that anymore, do you? Dave's going, I know Fred don't want to do that no more. And I don't want to go out there and be somebody. And you know what I think about the music business? I think it is a waste of time. You got to hit records and then 50 years later, nobody even knows who you were and they don't even go listen to your style that was 50 years ago. And you left nothing. You build a big business. You leave it to your kids. They sell it off. And most of them, because they weren't good businessmen like you, they spin it in a matter of just a few years and it's all gone and you work 50 years to get it. It's blown to the wind. What for? You didn't leave a legacy of any kind, did you? Nope. Look at there in 1 John. I flipped away from it. 1 John. There, here's the two men right here. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin for his seed. Speaking of the seed of Christ, his sporos, which comes from the word sperma, sperm, which is masculine and gender. The seed is the word of God. That's what the Bible says. Seed is not money like these ignoramuses at the Devil's Broadcasting Network, DBN, say. Seed is the word of God. It's the sporos. I've never seen, it's masculine gender. I've never seen a masculine dollar bill. And I know how they'd twist it. It's so old George Washington is on the dollar bill. He's masculine. You idiot. Stupid. His seed remaineth in him. The inner man, which is the seed, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, remains in you, and this inner man cannot sin because he's born of God. But that outer man can't quit. Same book, back to chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. What verse is that talking about? Talking about this man, the outer man. The man without sin is the inner man, Christ in you. And he says, I'm not going to live with you living this way. You're going to give up self. I'm going to break you. I'm going to break your neck. And I'm going to make you a quadriplegic. And you'll be laying in a hospital, unable to hardly talk or breathe with one of those respirators on you. And you're going to be saying, oh, God, I'm sorry. God will do what it takes. You say, God wouldn't do that to a physical human being. He'll make you sick and smite you because of your sin. He'll kill you. You're really joking, aren't you? It doesn't matter what God does to the body as long as he can make the spirit kill off this outer man. He's going to make you, that inner man in you, willing over the years to give up the way you live, give up self. If you belong to him, he's going to. And he says, you got two men in 1 John. One says you can't quit sinning. The other says you can't sin. What's he talking about? He's talking about those two men. That's why he says, for the people that he foreknew as his, he's predestined us. He's predestined this man out here to die daily and live according to the desires of the inner man that's in you. That he birthed in you by his will. That's the new birth. The new birth is something to hard to understand until you study the scriptures from this, from this view. He says the same thing over there in Ephesians, I believe it is. He's talking about look in Ephesians four. Look here in Ephesians four. Verse Verse uh, 19, speaking of, well, if I go up here, he's talking about the man that's following the winds of doctrine. He's past feeling. He's talking about believers who are apathetic. They don't care because they follow the winds of doctrine who being past feeling, verse 19, have given themselves over to lasciviousness, aselgia, which is just the desire to live the way you want, 
to work all uncleanness and greediness, but you have not so learned Christ the inner man. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, then put off the con concerning the former conversation the old man, the outer man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man. Put on, sink into clothing, in duo. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, therefore putting away lying. Stop deceiving each other, quit being forward, quit gossiping, quit slandering, quit being tail bearers and gossiping back and forth, quit being like those people that, those women that Paul talked about, going from house to house, gossiping, quit getting on your computers, going from house to house, gossiping, stop that, get off of Facebook, that is nothing but a gossip venue, did you know that? It's a place to start fights. You can't hear the inflection of the voice of the man that's talking. They may say something that they don't mean and it comes out wrong. Then don't say it if it can be interpreted as wrong. How in the world are you going to be able to say something on a chat room? We had a Grace and Truth chat room back in about 1998. It was a disaster. Fights, everybody bringing in every wind of doctrine possible. People fighting, getting mad, causing the church, trying to cause the church to split. It goes on right now with Facebook. I don't believe in Facebook. Now, you may go on it. You ought to get off of it. Haven't you noticed how many fights you get into on it? The guy that invented ought to be taken out and horse whipped. <laughs> it's a place to gossip. If you just, if you like uh, antique cars, you just want to get on there and talk about antique cars, fine. But if you're going to talk about some guy's antique cars are not as near as nice as your antique cars and his is cheaper, get, forget it. And I think that's the only way you can talk on it, isn't it? My sister-in-law is beautiful and she's tall, but I'll tell you one thing about her. <laughs> Don't talk if you can't get rid of that, the old conversation like he says. Am I out of time? Huh? Yes. Oh, am I? Well, put on that inner man. That's just, this is a message about predestination. He's got to conform us to the image of Christ because we're not like him when he births us and we have little faith, only gospistus, puny faith, and faith has to grow in that man out here and he has to die. He has to die to this old outer ways and start confessing Christ, and we have to learn to live godly and righteously in these mortal bodies. He says, I'm going to quicken your mortal bodies. He's going to quicken these bodies to live the way they're supposed to live. Don't use the excuse, well, we can go sin, that way grace can abound. Shall we sin that grace be abound? God forbid. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth and for your word. Help us to understand this message about our very selves, that's what predestination, Lord, is about. It's about us, how we're supposed to live and conform to your likeness. Help people to see this. I pray for the sheep that they will mature and become a full age. And I know this will happen over a long period of time, Lord, but give them strength to bear up under this. God will praise you and glorify you for all things. Lead us to your elect. Open up doors for the ministry. In Christ's name we pray, amen.